Hi, I'm Raghavan Arunachalam, a partner in Collier Bristow's corporate department who specialises in prior equity and chairs our prior equity audience group. Today, I'm joined by Janine Alexander, a partner in our dispute resolutions department, who's going to be guiding me through the world of litigation funding. And in particular, what you should look out for if you're going to invest into this class of asset. Hi, Janine. Hope you're well today. I'm very well, Raghavan. Hope you are too. Not too bad. Um, well, getting down to fast tax and the topic of today's conversation, I asked for a number of family officers who are more used to investing in private limited companies, assisting with the growth of such companies and then achieving a sensible exit with good returns. What are the likely returns on a litigation funding investment, in your opinion? Well, it very much depends, in my experience, on the type and size of the case concerned. Um, it's usually measured on the basis of a percentage of the damages to be obtained from the claim or a multiple of the costs invested, um, and often it's on a whichever is the higher basis. Um, the rule of thumb, um, since the litigation funding market developed, has always been it's about three times costs or 30% of damages. But um, having said that, the market has developed such that can vary depending on the type of case, the risks involved. Um, and so we had a funder, um, I wouldn't name them, who was speaking to us the other day, who was saying that it can vary between 15% of damages up to 40% and, you know, 1.5 times costs up to uh, three times costs. So um, it's all quite variable. And there are also structures that are quite common involving different returns based on the stage of settlement as well. So it's it's sort of hard to say overall, but I'd say, you know, broadly in my experience, it's looking at you know, the rule of thumb of three times investment and 30 percent of damages probably still is is reliable um, <laughs> overall, except for in unusual circumstances. So so certainly potentially a good return on your investment and something yeah. worth exploring. It is, um, although you do have to be uh, conscious of the risks involved because you don't get that sort of return without taking a significant yeah. amount of risk. I guess private equity investors are kind of used to that risk. They kind of, I think that the model is certain investments are bound to fail, and that's why they demand such high returns on the ones that do succeed. Yeah. I think another thing that uh, investors are concerned about are the time frame within which the investment will realise its value. Obviously, um, do you do you mind giving us a bit of an indication about what's your experience about time frames or returns? I think this is one of the key uncertainties about litigation or arbitration funding is that the difficulty in assessing how long it will take. Um, people, I think, sometimes do tend to underestimate or are persuaded to underestimate how long it may take. Um, if an early right. settlement is achieved, the investment will be less and the return will come within a few months. Um, although the return may be less, depending if you've agreed a sort of early settlement discount on the return. Um, but if a case goes to trial or arbitration hearing, I mean, that can take years, depending on how many interim applications there are, what the process is along the way. I mean, it can take typically two to three years to get to a final hearing, can be longer. And even then, once you've got the judgment, you then have to enforce it. So unless it's a very straightforward case for enforcement, as in the defendants in the UK, and there's no issue or resistance to it. Um, that, again, itself can take many months or years to get to. And that's before we even start talking about appeals and potentially appeals to the Supreme Court. So it is, a, you know, it's hard to say what the percentage is. A lot of cases get resolved within two to three years. Um, but there are a large percentage that will drag on longer than that. And I think people have to be realistic if they're going to invest in this type of asset, be realistic about how long it's going to take. Yeah, I think realism is probably the watchword, uh, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, if you're investing to a private limited company, you're, you're putting your capital in, but you're also taking time to professionalise the asset, um, deploy your resources to grow the value of it. So that takes time itself. So I, I think that it kind of seems commensurate with that kind of time period, two to three time period, potentially. Um, in terms of if an investor was looking to find an investment opportunity and and due diligence and litigation funding investment, how would they kind of go about that in your experience? 
Well, I think, um, I mean, law firms are obviously a good source of funding opportunities because they have cases that will come to them where they think, well, this is a viable case if um, it could be funded, but the claimant doesn't have the resources to do so. Um, so, so sometimes that, that's the way it works. Sometimes law firms think of an idea for a case um, before they get the clients, <laughs> it's becoming more common nowadays. So law firms think, well, there's a particular class of entity who have lost as a result of this particular organization's actions. And then they um, they book build clients and work up a proposal to take to a funder to say, well, if we work together, we can pull together a group of, you know, a certain industry companies who have got a claim against X. Um, there are there is expert advisors who do the same thing. So th those are opportunities if, if people are interested in doing this to speak to law firms um, themselves and potentially expert who will sometimes do this kind of origination work themselves. Um, you've also got the route that many funders take of just sort of advertising that they're available to do funding on their website and you know just general marketing activities. That will produce, in my experience, a vast quantity of people wanting funding for their claims. And then what that creates, I suppose, is the task of sifting the, the wheat from the chaff, which is a, a difficult and often time consuming task. Yeah. Um, but that's another way of getting them. But the due diligence is, is really important. Um, there are lots of things to look at uh, other than the legal merits of the case. Um, so that includes, um, as well as is there a, a legal case with good prospects of success, it, the question is, what is it realistically worth in terms of quantum? Um, you get a lot of cases where the headline value is way more than actually you can realistically expect to achieve. You have to look at whether the defendant can pay. So there's no point winning. You've got a defendant who can't pay. And that should be a, a very important part of the upfront due diligence. Yeah, quite right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's the main thing. Um and also, will there be a need to enforce any judgment or arbitration award in another jurisdiction? And if so, how difficult a jurisdiction is it for that? How time consuming will that be? Um, that again, I mean, that's sort of part of can the defense sort of can the defendant and will the defendant be made to be able to, to pay? It's, it's all part of the same thing, really, is can you can you enforce on the judgment if you get it? Um I mean, there are other factors as well. So lots of funders are very concerned about the ratio of the cost to the likely damages. And that's for good reason, um, because if you, you get into a position where the funder um, is the main beneficiary from the litigation uh, rather than the claimant because of the way it's been structured and because the costs have become disproportionate to the amount at issue, then, um, I mean, that creates a number of difficulties. First of all, the claimant becomes less motivated to cooperate. Um, and also there can be issues with the um, the law on what's called champerty and maintenance about whether or not, you know, funding is is viable and enforceable. Um, I'll not go into the detail of that, but that's just, lots of funders want to make sure that you've got a, a, a one to ten, I think, is the preferred ratio. Some of them will go a bit beyond that. But um, I think it's important to make sure that your costs are not going to be disproportionate to the claim for lots of reasons. Um in relation to the assessing the legal merits, um, what the documents needed will vary from case to case. So some cases it will be fairly obvious just based on a legal opinion from either the law firm or counsel whether or not the claim is viable. In other cases, for example, professional negligence cases, you'll need an expert report um, in order to assess whether or not the claim is going to be viable. Um, often in cases where the witness evidence is going to be key, funders will assess the witnesses by either by getting draft witness statements will, and or speaking to them themselves to see whether they think they're credible. Um, mm. But it's just a case of looking through the case to see where are the what are the key features that are going to determine whether or not this succeeds and have we assured ourselves that everything is lined up um, such that it you know supports good prospects of success, which most people will talk about um, sort of sixty percent chances of success from the law firm or counsel. Um, it's always <laughs> it's always difficult with litigation to talk about percentages because actually litigation is a zero sum game in that you win <laughs> and you lose. Um, and I know I, you know I and various other various counsel will say it's, it's not the most reliable way to deal with it, but it's the only way that really can be used to assess it. So I think most funders will say 60% chance of success, um, but be careful about counsel's opinions, I think would be my message, because I've seen quite a number of cases that have come across my desk when I've been assessing them for funders, where they've been round the houses in that um, the claimant has gone to several different counsel and got 
perhaps five opinions saying this is not going to succeed. And then they've managed to get one opinion saying, yes, actually, we think it will. Um, so it's um, there's two reasons that can happen. The first one is, you know, well, one unlikely reason is this particular barrister is, is extremely clever and knows more than all the rest. <laughs> um, and is right. <laughs> That's unlikely sometimes. I've, I've exactly. seen, that, seen those cases. It doesn't always turn exactly. out to be the way. Yeah. Um, other more likely reasons are that the, the barrister who's given the positive opinion has um, been given instructions which have been adjusted, taking account of the learning from the other experiences, such that they've not been given all the information. Um, Maybe diplomatically or, put that, Janine. Yeah, exactly. Or that... Um, or that they're they're not you know particularly experienced in the area um, or something along those lines. So I think certainly I'd be very careful of anything where there have been various different opinions, and you want to see the instructions to make sure that the barrister hasn't been asked to make certain assumptions which are not recorded in the instructions, which would make a difference. Yeah, in invaluable experience, and yeah, it must be the case that um, making sure you due diligence the investment is always important, no matter what asset you're investing in, and it seems that. You know, making sure that the merits of the case have been independently verified uh, must be key to the whole process. What what are the kind of other risks involved? I, I guess DD mitigates some of the risks, but what other things would you want to draw to potential investors' attention as things they should be thinking about? Yeah, well, I think I mean, there's the inherent risk of losing the litigation, um, which, as you say, can be mitigated by due diligence, but will always remain substantial. I mean, as, as litigation lawyers or you know, as litigation arbitration, as disputes lawyers, um, we always start from a point where there's 20 percent risk of losing just because there is because things happen because, you know, things happen when witnesses get in the witness box. Things happen when the judge gets it wrong. Um, trials are just inherently risky. And so you're starting from there and then the risk works upwards from there. So wow. that's in the even in, even in the best case you've ever seen that's come across your desk, you've got a 20 percent risk of losing. Um, so there's always going to be a significant risk that um, litigation will lose. But that what that comes with then is the risk of paying the other side's costs, which um, which can be mitigated by after the event insurance, as it's called, sort of slightly cryptically. Um, but there is insurance available um, in order to uh, you know cover the risk of having to pay the other side's costs. It is um, it's subject to various criteria, which are similar to the things the funder will look at. So there's got to be a good prospect of success. Um, you can either pay the premium up front. Sometimes you can get a deferred premium. Um, it's only payable upon success. Um, it just depends on the what you want to do in the commercial terms that you negotiate with the insurers. But that is available. Um, Sometimes in larger cases, the insurance market doesn't have capacity to cover all of the risk. And I've seen in, in cases that I've been involved in um, instances where ATE cover has been obtained to start with, which was considered to be adequate. Things have then escalated. And when top up cover is requested or uh, sought for, it's not available either because the market doesn't have capacity or because um, the merits have changed. Something's happened on the way through the litigation. That means that the criteria are no longer met. Um, so whilst you can do quite a lot to mitigate the risk of having to pay the other side's costs, you can't um, entirely cover that off. Uh, it will always be there. Um, there's also, I mean, the other risk I would mention is the risk of disputes between the claimant and the funder uh, when the proceeds of the claim emerge. Um, what I've been uh, sort of half surprised but not surprised by in the course of my career is the speed with which the funder who comes to fund the litigation turns from the saviour um, of the claimant um, to a sort of greedy parasite who's trying to take all their money <laughs> right. when, they, when it comes in sure. um, is it, spectacular. Um, so there is that to bear in mind as well. And I think, um, you know, those disputes can be costly and time consuming um, and interfere with the level of the return as well, because obviously you've got to then pay to defend them. So, um, but I think they can be they can be mitigated if you've got a good, um, well-drafted funding agreement to start with, then that helps. Um, and I think also I would suggest a, a sort of careful consideration of which claimants are funded um, is important. So if you've got someone who's... Um, if you if you've got someone who seems to be reasonable will be reasonable to you know considering a settlement um and wants to have the litigation funded that's one thing if you've got someone who's got a grievance or a sort of personal grievance or a really sort of deep seated grievance against the other party and who just wants wants their pound of flesh and wants their day in court then i think that's the sort of situation where you're more likely to end up in difficulties 
So yeah. I think what I would encourage is a careful assessment of, of which claimants you're willing to fund to start with, which can avoid um, hopefully most of the disputes that can occur at the, at the end of the proceedings when everyone should be happy. <laughs> yeah. But often no one is. No, but it kind of it kind of it kind of doubles down on the importance of due diligence. You're looking at a, a complex matrix of factors, but also looking at the what, making sure you're picking up the right claimants will, will obviously be key. And and it's good that you're uh, the, there is a mechanic in terms of the insurance to 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 head your head your bets in t- in case of, of a loss. And it's great that you have that kind of experience to be able to assist with the kind of right placing the right kind of insurance to ensure that there's you know, it's not a one size fits all kind of affair. You need to be able to get the correct insurance for not only now, but potentially events in the events in the future if you need to top it up. So as you kind of briefly touched on there, I guess the funding agreement is is going to be is going to be key to kind of delineating the roles and the and the upside and downside to the investment. Can you can you just talk me through um, a bit more about how litigation funding investments are structured and and how the detail is important in protecting the investment? Yes, well, I mean, it's not in some ways it's not that unusual in that you'll have you know the usual structures. You have a funder and a claimant. They sign a funding agreement. That will include various protections similar to any other asset class. So you'll have warranties, indemnities, dispute resolution provisions. Um, And then there's a waterfall which will set out how the claim proceeds will be distributed and in what order, um, assuming litigation wins, as between the claimant, the funder, the solicitors, CFA, sort of at-risk element, and any ATE insurers that who, who are involved um, if they've got deferred premiums. There will also be within that um, agreement lots of litigation funding specific matters such as how much ATE cover will be obtained, how and um, when additional cover will be procured um, and in what circumstances. Oh, you'll also have uh, issues involving changes to the budget. So that's another issue that quite often comes up is there's a budget agreed at the beginning of the litigation, but litigation or arbitration is unpredictable. Um, the, it's not entirely within the claimant's control how much it's going to cost because the other side might do things. They might make applications, you know, whether or not they're justified is another matter. But there are things that are outside of the claimant's control that you know mean that the budget may change. So it's important to have provision to deal with that Um without having disputes arise. There is the potential addition of co-funders is another issue. So I suppose that's what you would call dilution in other circumstances. But um, there's there's a question arises if the if the budget becomes you know beyond what the funders agreed to commit, how will that be dealt with? Can someone right. else come in? So that's a that is a, you know becomes an important issue if it arises. And so it's important to have provision to deal with it. Um, yeah. And then there are also provisions to do with security for costs is actually an issue that quite often people overlook. So often in cases that are funded, the defendant will say, well, look, there's this sort of commercial entity behind this case that's going to make a lot of money if it wins. Um, but I'm at risk for my costs, so I should have security for those. And so the money should be put into court up front to make sure that I don't end up out of pocket if this all goes wrong. Right. Um, and the courts have been quite sympathetic to that approach. So there does need to be provision to deal with that and you know, um, confirm who and how that will be paid if it arises. And sometimes security can be ordered not just against the claimant who's bringing claim, which then the funder would be asked to support, um, but also directly against the funder itself. Um, that's a, a sort of jurisdiction that's developing and has been over the last few years. Um, so it's important not to overlook that. As well as that, there will be provisions for monitoring the proceedings. So funders will also want to know what's going on as things happen and to make sure they're up to date with developments. It's usually fairly light touch, and that's necessarily so, uh, because funders can't control the litigation or have got uh, can't be seen to do so. They've got to be quite yeah. careful not to do so, because if they do, then it becomes an issue of um, maintenance and you've got issues about maintenance and property, mostly maintenance yeah. in this instance, um, which might mean that your funding arrangement is unenforceable. So it's important important to be careful that you're, you're funding the litigation yes you can be kept up to date with what's going on but it's very important not to um, be controlling the litigation 
In terms of settlement, which is the point where funders definitely do want to, you know, be involved and know what's going on, uh, usually the, the mechanisms will be set up such that the claimant is required to accept a reasonable settlement offer. Um, otherwise, well, they're not required to accept it, but if they don't accept it, then the consequences will be their funding will be withdrawn and usually they have to repay the funder the investment to date. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's not the funder is controlling the litigation whether the claimant settles, it's the funder is controlling the terms of the funding arrangement. Um, and that uh, generally works quite well. Uh, there will be usually a mechanism for an independent assessment if there's a dispute about whether a settlement offer is reasonable. So yeah. the idea will be you, you have a settlement offer, the law firm or counsel involved will advise whether or not it should be accepted. And then if the claimant doesn't accept it and the funder thinks the claimant's being unreasonable um, because the law firm has recommended it, essentially, um, then there will be usually an independent QC who will look at it and give an opinion as to whether or not the claimant is behaving reasonably in doing so and whether the offer is reasonable. So that's um, that's how that's dealt with. Uh, there will also be trust and security provisions uh, to protect so far as possible the funder's interest in the proceeds of the claim. Um, usually that involves thing, mechanisms like the proceeds must be paid to the claimant solicitors who will then hold them upon trust for the funder. Um, none, of, none of these arrangements can be entirely foolproof, um, but in, in, you know, in most cases that it can be quite tightly woven up so that it's very difficult for the claimant to do anything uh, that will undermine the funder's interests. And yeah, so that's the, those are the main things that those are the main protections against the, the risks involved, which I think, as you probably gathered, are, are sort of split evenly between risks involving losing the litigation itself and risks involving having a row with the claimant <laughs> at the end of it all um, when the proceeds arrive, which seem to be the two main risks involved overall. I mean, and, and thanks for making it so clear. Um, I, I guess something that has occurred to me is there is there a sense that having a, a, a kind of a claimant with a, a funder with deep pockets, does that often bring defendants to the table more quickly or likely get a better result? Or do that just doesn't really have an, an, an effect on, on, on de-risking the whole process and investment? It's a really interesting question, Raghavan, um, because, you know, there's one school of thought would say, well, the fact that the defendant knows that they can't outspend the claimant yeah. um, means that they're more likely to come to the table quicker and say, OK, it's a it's a fair cop, you know, we'll we'll pay up. Um, but on the other hand, you know, generally, in some cases, the, the, the involvement of funders can make things more difficult, um, particularly if the funder um, has quite a big interest in the in the proceeds. Um, such that it, it's more difficult to settle the case on terms that are acceptable to the claimant because they've got to deal with paying the funder as well. So I don't know, I'd say probably on balance overall, if you've got, it, what, it, what it will prevent, I think, is if you've got a case where the defendant knows that you know, there's a 70, 60, 70% chance that the claimant's going to succeed, it's probably going to help prevent them from dragging it out just in the hope of getting a better result because they, you know, they've made them spend money. Um, I think it will prevent that. I think in other cases where it's more finely balanced, sometimes it does work the other way. So I think a funder, if you're going to get into this, I think you do have to be prepared to see it all the way through and not kind of expect that it will, um, that, that the fact that there's funding involved will make the settlement happen earlier. I think that's, I wouldn't assume it. In some cases <laughs> it's correct, but I, do, I, I think it's dangerous to assume it is my litigator's uh, risk averse perspective on the thing. <laughs> It's all about. It's all always, always about the details. I guess. Uh, so, having walked us through um, uh, the, the potential risks, the importance of due diligence, the importance of really uh, testing the, the 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 strength of the the, the case, um, how to structure the investment using uh, you know a, a, a well drafted funding agreement, um, how to um, mitigate downside in terms of after ATE cover. I mean, something that uh, investors will be interested in, in is how easy if during part of the process, you know, it's taking too long, I want to sell or exit my investment. How easy is that to do? Um, it's an interesting question. So it, it has come up in various cases I've been involved in. Um, it does happen. So there is, um, I've seen cases where, you know, funders have said, particularly when you get to the stage of judgment, um, have said, okay, well, I've done it this far, but then taken an offer for someone from someone else to fund the cost of the enforcement proceeding. Right, okay, that, that would seem logical, um, yeah. 
So that's relatively common. I mean, in the course of the case, I've seen also issues where it's come up where someone will either come in to co-fund or to finish off the funding and you agree terms for that. But I think overall, it would be probably safest um, and more realistic to assume that it's it's an illiquid investment, a very illiquid investment. And so um, if you get that's into it. it, it's best to assume you're in it for the long run. I think, I think the cases where you'll be able to exit before that um, are... Problem. It's difficult to say whether they're less common. I think the trouble is, again, as you as you say, it depends on the details. Yeah. So I think in practice, the reasons why people want to exit these investments are usually because the thing is dragging on, it's taking too long, um, the merits are deteriorating um, for whatever reason. And once you get into that situation, you know, whether you want to, if you want to exit, you're sort of looking for a buyer who's willing to take it on. And it, it's a it's a buyer's market i suppose is what i'm saying yeah. generally um if it's going well people usually want to stay in it so i think overall <laughs> yes. exactly overall i'd say probably treat it as an a, a very illiquid investment i think i, I think that's that, that must be sensible and it kind of goes back to the the need to at the outset do your uh, check the legal merits um and I- I- investors are you know it, it's important um for them to uh, consider a variety of factors, not only returns, not only timeframes of um, those returns and, and the risks involved, but also, would you say there's any reputational risks involved in, in, in involving themselves in this class of investment? say generally there are um provided due diligence has been done um cases can be high profile and they can attract press attention they will be hard fought and the funder's name may well come out for various reasons to do with you know applications for security for costs or um if you know particularly if the litigation loses or even on an interim basis if an application is lost there will be questions about who's going to pay and whether it's the funder so the, it, the name can come out um as to who's backing it but as long as the due diligence has been done properly and the claim is signed of itself, um, that's unlikely to be problematic, I think, in re- reputation terms of the funder. Uh, there's more risk, I suppose, of reputational issues where the claimant raises a dispute at the end of it all, um, I think, because they're disgruntled about something. So, you know, as with previous answers, I think, again, if you're thinking about reputational risks, I think choosing claimants wisely is a good idea. And I suppose probably choosing the type of claim wisely is a good idea um, and thinking about whether um, if the press were looking at this particular claim, whether they're likely to be sympathetic to the claimant's cause or whether there, there's any reputational risk involved. But that's, again, very much a case-specific issue. Yeah, yeah. S- s- sound advice, I think. Um, and are there any personal risks to um, private equity investors if things go wrong? Um, well, I think that the bottom line is that the, the inherent risk in all of this or the key inherent risk in all of this is the risk of having to pay the other side's costs of paying the defendant's costs. Um, the court does have huge discretion um, and to you know disregard any corporate veil as relevant to get to the source of the person who has been funding or the, 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 the genesis of the pursuit of the action essentially so if an action has been pursued against a defendant who's been forced to incur you know let's say two million pounds worth of costs in defending it and if that action fails and the court decides that it, you know it shouldn't be brought for that reason um then um there is the ability to go back to the original source of the pursuit of the action so for example if you've got you, you can set up an spv um to do the litigation funding but the owner of the SPV will still be liable if the SPV doesn't have enough money to pay. So I think what I would say overall is um, in relation to the third, um, sorry, I say the third party, I mean the defendant's costs and the risk of having to pay those, it's important to be realistic about how much those are, um, either cover them with AT insurance or ensure that you've got adequate provision to cover them um, without having to um, use your personal resources. Uh, So that's that's the position. There is there is theoretically um, uh, the potential for personal exposure. As long as you're realistic and have thought properly about the other side's costs, then you know it should be okay. And, and, and finally, if a private equity investor wanted to explore this type of investment, how could Collier Bristow help? Well, what we can do um, and have done before is assist with independent due diligence of their proposal. So that will include the legal merits and the other aspects referred to um, previously. Um, so including looking at the 
and the means of the defendant, uh, possibly with external forensic um, and corporate intelligence consultants who can make sure that the, the means are going to be there. Uh, we can also draft and negotiate funding documents. Uh, we can assist with arranging the after the event insurance cover to cover the risk of having to pay the, the other party's costs. And we can also provide independent advice all the way through the process. So helping to monitor the investment, um, looking at any developments that happen along the way, differences in legal opinion where you know things change, and also any disputes that arise along the way, either between the claimant and the funder or with the other party, for example, regarding security for costs. Great. So it, it sounds like we can handhold clients through the entire process and and yes, uh, exactly and have, have done so. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That was what I said, and have experience of uh, the nuances of uh, what sometimes looks looks too good to be true, and what sometimes is good. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, experience of assessing assessing um, claims and looking at what's 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 very important is looking at what's not there as well as what is right. there. That's the that's the key because I think what what we have is quite a sophisticated market nowadays, and what we see as well as the law firm, not just as um, looking at it for third party funders, but looking at it from our own perspective, we quite often have people who come to us who want to take their case on on a CFA, which essentially means that we're funding it. Um, and so we have to look at those cases quite skeptically um, and sort of differently to the usual client relationship and think, quite, OK, what information am I being given? What information might be out there that I don't have? And again, I mean, as I said, I think my sort of key rule is, is think about what you can't see as opposed to um, just looking at what you can see. Um, so I was about to ask you about your key message, but uh, thanks for that. <laughs> I think you just summarised it very succinctly. I think, that's, I think that's what it is. It's um, yeah. We what we have is the I suppose what we have is the knowledge and experience to understand what um, should be there and could be there that isn't. I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and, that, and that's the hard part, really, because you uh, you can you can be presented with a, a nice uh, narrative, but if you if you don't know what really should be there, you're not going to uh, immediately realise what's missing. Um, Great. Well, um, thank you for your time in walking me through uh, litigation funding. I certainly feel I know a lot more about how the process works and what I should be on the lookout for and and what I should be trying to seek to put into place in order to mitigate my risk and maximise my returns. Yeah, which is what everyone wants to do in, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. in relation to every investment. <laughs> well, thank you, very, thank you very much, Ragavan. It's been really interesting to chat it through.